on the first video, we have learned about the importance of stress transformation. And here we will derive the equations that we are going to use for stress transformation. So let's start with one simple case. Consider a plate that is made up by welding two plate as shown in this figure. This plate is subjected to an axial force of P, and we want to determine the state of stress at different points in this structure. In many practical engineering problems, we make different components by welding them together. And typically, the welding point, the welding line is going to be the weakest part of the structure. So we need to ensure that stresses that are developing on that welding line are not going to exceed the maximum allowable stress. Before talking about how much would be stress at that point, let me introduce the concept of stress element. Stress element is an element that represents the state of stress, either normal or shear, at a certain point within a body of structure. And that could be defined for two-dimensional or three-dimensional elements. We start with two-dimensional, and then later on, we are going to expand it to three-dimensional stress elements. At the beginning, I'm going to consider one stress element, which is shown here in purple, along the vertical cut. In order to determine the state of stress at that point, we need to use free body diagram and determine how much is the internal force. That internal force is going to produce internal axial stress, internal normal stress along the cut section. That axial stress is assumed to be uniformly distributed on that cut section. If I take out that stress element and enlarge that, there will be one normal stress on the left surface where that element is being cut. But in order to maintain equilibrium on this stress block, we need to have the same amount of stress in the horizontal direction on the opposite face. Same is true for stress in the vertical direction. If there was stress in the vertical direction, it should exist on two opposite surfaces. But in this case, there is no stress in the vertical direction, so I'm not going to show that. Now let's calculate how much is that stress. Sigma x is going to be force divided by area. Force is p, and area is simply the width of the plate multiplied by its thickness. B multiplied by T. And T is going to be 1, so stress in the horizontal direction is simply force divided by the width of the plate, P divided by B. Okay, that is representing state of stress for that particular point. If I move the stress element down here, or if I move it in every other point within the body of this plate, that stress is going to be the same. Now let's look into the state of stress on that inclined plane. In this case, instead of considering the vertical cut, we are going to cut that parallel to the welding. Remember that in this case, that stress element H has rotated to have that face along the inclined plane of that weld. Now let's use the concept of free body diagram. In order to maintain equilibrium, the same amount of force should exist on that plane. This force has two components. One of them is going to be the force perpendicular to the cut section or normal to the cut section. I'm going to show that by N. The magnitude of that force could be easily determined based on the angle of this inclined line, which is shown by theta. Normal force is going to be P multiplied by cosine of theta. In a similar way, there will be another component of that force P in a direction parallel to that cut surface. V is going to be P multiplied by sine of theta. So that force P is now split into two components. Now we can determine how much would be the magnitude of stress produced by each of these two. Let's start with the magnitude of stress produced by force N. This force is going to be perpendicular to that cut section, so it is producing normal stress. And that normal stress is shown by sigma sub n. n stands for the normal direction. That stress is going to be force divided by the cross-section area. Area of that inclined plane is going to be a, the width of that inclined plane, multiplied by the thickness. And the thickness is assumed to be 1. a would be equal to b divided by cosine of theta. Normal stress is force divided by area. Area is b divided by cosine of theta and n itself is p multiplied by cosine of theta. So that is going to be simplified to p divided by b multiplied by cosine squared of theta. What is p divided by b? From the previous page, we saw that p divided by b is going to be the normal stress in the horizontal direction. So in other words, in this way, we can find a relationship between the normal stress on the inclined plane and the normal stress 
on the original plane based on the angle of rotation of theta. In a similar way, we can determine how much is shear stress on that inclined plane. Shear stress is going to be shear force divided by area. And shear force is P multiplied by sine of theta. Area is B divided by cosine of theta. So that would be simplified to be sigma x multiplied by sine of theta and cosine of theta. We developed two equations for determining the stresses on that inclined plane based on stress on the original plane, or sigma x. On the original plane, or x direction, there was no shear stress. But on the inclined plane, there will be some shear stresses, which is actually produced by transforming part of that normal stress sigma x into shear stress. So remember that these two forces, n and v, they are not going to be additional forces. They are simply projection of force P in two different planes. Okay, these two equations that we developed would be valid for the simplest case where there is just one stress in the horizontal direction, sigma x. But what if we have stresses in the vertical direction and also there is shear stress on the original plane? That would be more complex but the magnitude of those stresses could be determined using the same concept of free body diagram and projecting the forces in different directions. I'm not going to prove those equations in details, but I'm going to give you the final equations that could be used for stress transformation. Consider a general state of stress in a two-dimensional problem. In that state of stress, there are three independent stresses, stress in the x direction, stress in the y direction, and shear stress. Now let's assume that this stress element has rotated to a new state with the angle of theta. And if we want to determine how much are sigma n, sigma t, and ta and t in that element, we are going to use these stress transformation equations. Sigma n was sigma x multiplied by cosine squared of theta. This is the equation that we just proved. But that was in the case that we had just sigma x. If sigma y exists, there will be one additional term which is sigma y multiplied by sine squared of theta. And if shear stress exists, there will be an additional term, which is 2 multiplied by ta xy sine of theta and cosine of theta. In a similar way, we can determine how much is normal stress in the t direction. This is the plane that has the angle of theta plus 90 degrees. In a similar way, we can determine shear stress on that inclined plane. So these are three equations give us magnitude of normal stress and shear stress on that rotated stress element. These three equations could be rewritten in a different form. These are alternative equations for determining normal stress and shear stress on the inclined plane. Either one you use, you are going to get the same answer. But sometimes some of these equations are easier to work with. Typically, we work with the top equations but sometimes we also use the bottom equations. The last part that I want to review here would be stress invariance. We can prove that independent from the angle of rotation, some of the normal stresses are going to be always constant. That is called I sub one. Sigma X plus sigma Y is going to be equal to sigma N plus sigma T on the rotated plane. So independent from the angle of theta, some of the normal stresses on the element are going to be equal to each other. The second stress invariant is called I sub 2, and that says the multiplication of the normal stress minus shear stress squared is going to be always constant and dependent from the angle of theta. These two equations are sometimes used for simplifying the calculation of stresses in different cases. Now I think it's time for us to practice a problem. First, I'm going to ask you to solve one problem, which is simply using one of these equations and determine the stress, state of stress on the rotated plane. This is the stress element. And what we need to do for solving this problem would be using sigma n equation and then plug sigma x, sigma y, and theta into this equation and determine how much would be the magnitude of sigma n for this problem. Okay, that was pretty much straightforward, right? Now I'm going to ask you another problem, which is very similar to this problem, but it's tricky. And that is the same configuration that you see here, but now stresses are given on the N and T plane, and we want to determine how much is stress on the original plane. 
One way that some students tried would be solving a system of three equations and three unknowns, because we would use one of these two families of equations, sigma n, sigma t, and tau n t are provided, and we can solve that for sigma x, sigma y, and tau x y. That would be one way, which is difficult to do. But that's not what we want to do for this problem. For solving this problem, can I assume the original plane is on an nt and then rotate it back to this plane? So instead of considering x and y as the original, I'm going to assume that the original is n and t. And then how much should I rotate this element in order to get to that x and y plane? Instead of rotating that by the angle of alpha, I need to rotate that by the angle of negative alpha. That's it.